Laura uh, Arnold Leibman is a professor of English and Humanities um, at Reed College in Portland, in Oregon. Um, and she is interested in material culture, and this talk will be a testament uh, to this. She's interested in early um, American history and, of course, Jewishness, with an emphasis on uh, uh, women's history and gender. So I think this uh, pretty much represents the main avenues of uh, today's talk and also of her uh, amazing book uh, that you can see here, the yellow thing, and you'll see more of this um, uh, in Laura's slides, um, uh, that this talk is based on and the book uh, titled The Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects. Bard Graduate Center 2020 was published last year and won uh, multiple awards, including three National Jewish Book Awards. Not one, three. <laughs> um, Laura um, uh, is teaching now at the Reed College, but uh, uh, she traveled and lectured internationally, and her stays abroad include uh, Oxford University. She was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Utrecht, uh, also University of Panama. Uh, so uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the way I think Laura's, about Laura's scholarship, uh, her internationality and uh, uh, is reflected in the transnational focus. Uh, this is so much present in the way she thinks about uh, um, humans, but also about Jewishness. Uh, her second book, the earlier book, published in 2012, uh, Messianism, Secrecy, and Mysticism, 2012, uh, also won multiple awards. Um, but, you know, some people may, uh, you know, pandemic is hard for us, but Laura has another book coming out uh, this year that also um, is, uh, I think, joins these avenues that I described. Uh, the book is called Once We Were Slaves, uh, The Extraordinary Journey of a Multiracial Jewish Family. Um, it's coming out uh, in the fall, I believe, uh, from Oxford University Press. And uh, it also, I think, breaks new ground in thinking about Jewish Americans of color and how an enslaved family, uh, a Jewish family from the Caribbean became a, a very important family uh, in um, uh, in uh, New York City. So join me in welcoming Laura Leibman. I'm really looking forward uh, to your talk, uh, The Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York in Five Objects. Thank you so much, Carolina. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, if you have pressing questions as I'm speaking, go ahead and put them in the chat and you won't get me off track if there's something that's needed for understanding the content, I'm happy to pause. So as Carolina mentioned, this book um, is in some ways building off of the kind of work that I did earlier in the Messianism, Secrecy and Mysticism book, which also looked at a wide range of objects from early Jewish America. And it looked at more kind of traditional Jewish objects, things like gravestones and synagogues and food, so things that we might naturally associate as having like Jewish content. But um, one of the things that came out of writing that book was my experience very early on with getting reviews back about it and something that sort of continued to trouble me and then really influenced how I went about approaching the more recent book. And for those of you who are either in academia or burgeoning academics, you're probably well aware of the phenomenon of re reviewer number two. And I think it's important to know this happens to all of us, right? Like this is just like how it goes down that we all agree reviewer number two is always mean and bitter, um, doesn't like puppies. You know, we all have these examples of people who've had a paper rejected because they didn't cite themselves well enough. Um, I certainly have gotten that comment occasionally that they're like, you need to look at the research of Liebman. And I'm like, I am Liebman, I'm just trying not to be a jerk and cite myself. So again, reviewer number two, and I certainly had this very early on in the process of this book where I went out for review, 
at a press to see if they wanted to give it a contract. And renewer, reviewer number two, who I refer to in my head now as Gollum, um, came back with a whole list of things that Gollum hated about this proposed book. Um, the most urgent of which was um, he didn't like that I was talking about messianism and suggested that I get rid of that if I wanted to publish the book. And since it's in the title, you can imagine that was a pretty high bar for me to like do in terms of revision. So I eventually gave up on reviewer number two and just went to a different press. But some of the other things that he said were also kind of troubling to me as a female academic. One was I was taking too many risks. And I feel like we should always be aware when reviewer number two says something like to, that to us to reject what they're saying. Like, that's my job as an academic is to take some risks, not to like be as, as timid as possible to preserve other people's ideas. So there was a variety of things he also didn't like, like whatever, whatever. There was like 12 pages of single space things that reviewer number two really didn't like about everything. Um, but one of the things that stuck with me in spite of the fact that I think of him as Gollum, was his annoyance at my chapter on ritual baths. And um, the ritual baths chapter, I was really looking at women and how women were experiencing ritual life. And uh, Gollum was very angry at this because he wanted me to be citing more things from women's perspective. And I was like, Sure, Gollum, I would like that too. But it turns out women didn't write about ritual baths during this time period because there's all these discussions of secrecy around family purity. So I'm sort of trapped here by what the sources are doing. And it turns out I'm not the first person to notice this problem, that if you look at other scholars who've written about women in early Jewish America, they consistently cite this as why it's so difficult to talk about women for this early time period, um, that women just wrote almost nothing. In fact, Jacob Ratter Marcus, who put together a thousand pages of a documentary history of American Jewish women, of that thousand pages, only 60 were from before 1800, and most of those weren't even written by women. So that gives you a sense of like the paucity of what we're talking about. So I really became kind of interested in what do we do when we're lacking the kinds of sources that we would like in order to get that women's perspective. And I would say scholars have tended to have two um, things going on. One is they kind of look at the sources and they realize, huh, even the things we have, such as this letter from Hannah Lusada, gay, it's from 1761, gay, she wrote it herself but it's this weird little fragment of a piece of her life. And so it becomes very hard to figure out what's the big story here. So scholars have tended to respond to these little bits and fragments with two main strategies. One is they kind of throw their hands up in despair. They're like, oh, well, moving on to other time periods where women wrote, can't do anything. Um, and so not surprisingly, most scholarship on Jewish American women comes after women start to write more texts. That seems kind of like a logical response. The other response that scholars have had is to really turn to the very few women who actually have written uh, texts from this time period. And those are women like Rebecca Gratz or Abigail Franks. And as you might be able to tell from these portraits of them, they tend to be very, very wealthy women and very exceptional women. So in my mind, this is a little bit like as if today I wanted to write a history of American Jewish women today. And my only example was the lectures and writings of Ivanka Trump. And I would sort of feel like, regardless of my politics, this would be skewed, right? You know, like she's just not that, um, she, her life is so far away from the mass of the rest of us that, it gets this weird sense of like, what are Jewish women's issues by only looking at a few wealthy women. And this is not to say that I, I'm not trying to disparage these two women because I love them a lot, but just trying to get it, like there's something structurally odd about that evidence. So when I began to think about this problem that Gollum had raised, um, even as I was trying to like shed some of what he was saying, 
I was trying to really think hard about what kinds of sources, even with the material culture that I was using, that might help me get more at women's experiences. And what I started to do was to really think about how the very definitions of what we consider Judaica tend to be very gendered. That they tend to be objects that were used by men, such as the Kiddush cup that you see over here, um, and which, were, which depicts men doing a Kiddush, um, a Friday night ceremony over the wine, um, and would have been held by men primarily, right? So like, I guess women would have washed it maybe, but, but primarily a men's item. And similarly, most of the ritual items from the synagogue tended to be for this time period, objects used by men. So I was trying to figure out how could I get away from that to think about what objects were important for women for Jewish identity during this time period. So I started to turn to objects that were more like this teacup that we see on the other side. So this teacup um, also depicting a Caribbean. So this is probably um, a coconut from the Caribbean based on the shape of the coconut. Apparently you can um, go and look at where coconuts are from based on their shape. There's a whole science to this, a uh, DNA sequencing of coconuts, who knew? In any case, um, so this cup also depicting from the, from the Caribbean, but the tone, a town that was a semi-autonomous Jewish town called Yodin Savannah, but it was a cup that would have primarily been part of tea rituals, which were led by women, typically the oldest woman in the household with the most status. So here I'm trying to think about, this also is getting at Jewish life and what it means to be a Jew, but is a different kind of ritual, one that is maybe more identity-based, but very much thinking about still with the synagogue being depicted um, on the cup and being part of the discussion of how you're presenting yourself. So really the shift from kiddush cups to teacups in some ways. But one of the things that I noticed as I started to look at these objects, even at the ones that were um, more in the teacup category, these more quotidian everyday objects that Jewish women were using, is that they also had this weird fragmentary basis. And you'll see on the back, I was really interested when I first got this image that it has this little thing on the back corner of it. I was like, what is that? And um, so I asked the, um, the curator who very generously at, at the Amsterdam Jewish Historical Museum, if she would flip it around and photograph the back for me. And this is what we found. So on the back, um, you can see it's still on its little archive shelf. Um, the back is actually missing the handle. And for me, this became very symbolic of part of the problem of what I was grappling with, with trying to think about women's lives and women's objects during this time period. It wasn't just that women weren't writing, but that we were constantly missing parts of the story. In this case, literally the handle, but in addition, we were missing key information about this cup. So we, this cup is in the museum collection, but we don't actually know who first owned it. Um, so what family it was that was using it, which would have been super nice to know. I would love that kind of information. And also these cups are, are typically parts of large sets that depict different scenes and we're missing all the rest of the set. So I wanted to know like, was this all different Jewish scenes or were these all different scenes from Suriname? What was the context? So again, one of these struggles was what's going on with women's objects that were constantly dealing with this fragmentary state. So as I move forward with this book, what I was really interested in was going back to things like Hanna Lusada's letter and not trying to get rid of that idea of fragmentation, but thinking about fragmentation and the paucity of sources as really being part of the story. So for me, the fact that her life has been fragmented and that this is the only kind of resource we have about her is actually part of what we need to know about Jewish women's lives during this time period, and also issue of archiving, of what gets kept and what doesn't get kept. So for me, this really then set the stage for the rest of the book that I was interested in thinking not just about the minutia of the object, 
but what structural forces were creating these issues that I was seeing across the different records. And here I have to say, it was very helpful that in between the previous book and this one, I had been working on a collection called Jews in the Americas, where I'd gone to dozens of archives and looked for dozens of different uh, manuscripts and cataloged and transcribed all sorts of synagogue meetings from, from all across the Americas. And that actually was quite helpful for starting to see these patterns as well. But basically what I came to think about was that there were four forces creating this initial problem of why we didn't have the kind of sources that we might have wanted initially, regardless of what got kept. And those were first, the way that charity and poverty worked during this time period. Second, the way that education was working and how women were being educated. Third was secular laws. And the fourth, for this particular instance, and with some other cases, had to do with the way that mental illness was being treated during this time period. So when I went back to Hannah's letter, I was then really interested in the kind of materiality of why was this one saved and what could I get from the very way that it was created. And I was really interested in, although it had been dismissed by previous scholars as being um, an almost unintelligible English, um, her handwriting is actually pretty good. So I'll read it to you um, for those of you who don't read early American handwriting quite as often. It's from New Brunswick from November 1761. She says, sir, I take the liberty to write you now. I think that it is time for you to get my winter's provisions. Likewise, a little money to buy some wood for the winter. I would uh, come down myself to fetch it, but being disabled, my legs having swelled. But I hope, sir, that ancient proverb not out of sight, out of mind, here applies to me. Um, here I lay suffering for uh, want of wood and provisions and remain, sir, your most humble servant, Hannah Lusada. So I was really interested in this kind of like, I would have come down myself to fetch it, which is kind of non-standard English. But again, her handwriting is so nice um, for, for people such as myself who've read a lot of documents from this time period by people who are impoverished this is not a poor person's or uneducated person's writing. And so I was really interested in how I could understand that disconnect between the two. And one of the things that really interested me was this little curly Q under her name, which is called a Rubica, and indicates that she was very explicitly, most likely seeing herself as Sephardic. It's something that we associate with the Iberian legacy and which is very much maintained proactively by Sephardic Jews and their descendants in the colonies, even when they're in English speaking countries. So that suggested to me, she might not have actually been originally from London or from the New York area, um, but maybe had been educated in Spain and Portugal. And I found another letter by her that was to Aaron Lopez, one of the wealthy men that was in Spanish and it's beautiful Spanish. So I think here we get that sense of her Spanish here is so elegant in terms of the echoes and the sound, and she's writing as if she's read every letter writing manual explaining how to suck up to people in the world in order to get what she needs. It's just very much clear that she is somebody who is educated to write, not just handwrite, but like the formality of written Spanish during this time period. So this helped me because we didn't know whether she was somebody who was um, just married to somebody Sephardic from her last name, but this indicates she most likely is Sephardic. She's somebody whose ancestors were from Spain and Portugal. Either she was born in Spain and Portugal or she's educated in some place like Amsterdam or London or Hamburg that has these uh, communities where the education is teaching people how to do this elegant Baroque Spanish. The other thing that was really interesting to me is um, somebody had apparently thought she was illiterate early on when after her husband died and on the inventory she signed her name and they put her mark. But those of you who read Hebrew will notice that they put her name on either side. Her, her mark, which usually means she scribbled an X, um, is actually her name in Hebrew. So clearly English is not just her second language, but maybe even her third language. And that also sort of gets at this idea of 
that she is educated quite differently than um, we might have expected. So for me, this pattern, of, whoops, I'm going to go back one. This pattern of education was so important for understanding her because it's something we see consistently across colonial women and helps explain why there's so few documents by them. Women tend to be a low priority financially for being educated in the colonies. So um, that is sort of a step against them. But when they are educated, they tend to be educated in the religious Jewish languages, the Spanish and Portuguese and Hebrew, as opposed to the mercantile languages of the communities. So when she, her husband dies and she needs to run a store, she has not much language to fall back on and her store fails. It's not because she's inept, it's not because she's totally uneducated, it's because she's educated in the way that women were educated during this time period. The second thing that seemed really important to me for understanding her poverty and why she's so reliant on people and why she's, her life is so fragmented is the way that the secular laws in this area worked, which is that because her husband died without a will and because of where she lives in New Jersey, she does not inherit anything from her husband's estate. So, um, and it, we don't have her early marriage contract from the Jewish side, so she has nothing to protect her. Third, her son um, who inherits everything is declared insane and everything goes to the town according to the secular laws then. So again, we see these ways in which the secular laws are actually creating a lot of the problems um, of what um, she's experiencing. And the reason why we see so many women on the poor rolls during this time period, about a third of the synagogue's um, expenses went to paying for impoverished Jews during this time period in New York. And um, most of those are widows, probably because of secular laws like this and the way women are educated. So you can see how hard, how many things she is up against for creating records that would be preserved. So that was really a lot of the work that I was doing in this first one was trying to think about why it was that women weren't creating the records that we would expect for the later time periods. In the second chapter, I turned to a very different kind of object, um, which was to look at a set of six silver beakers, which were created by a very famous Jewish silversmith, Meyer Myers. Usually when people look at Myers, they don't look at these kind of cups that would just be a household cup. They look at something that would be on a Torah scroll or something that would be used in a ritual circumcision. So I was really interested again in that shift towards what's an everyday object. And most of the time, the woman had dropped out of the equation of the discussion of these cups and it was all about the man who had made them, but they were given as a wedding gift to his niece and really cemented these two parts of the family. For me, this became very symbolic because marriages during this time period, women were often used to create these mercantile bonds between different families. So that exchange of silver that we would see in marriages and this gifting of silver became very important as a way of connecting people. And in fact, the silver maker's son ends up becoming sort of a business partner of her new husband. So it definitely pays off the gift. So part of what I was interested in then was not just these ritual objects, like in a wedding, I would exchange silver, uh, which is part of the Jewish marriage ceremony, but really trying to think about how women were part of this process of everyday silver being passed through family lines. And we know her silver cups, some of them went to her son and then to one of her grandsons and then over to her great grandson. And another one went to one of her daughters. I was really interested in how did those decisions get made about who got what. And so one of the things that I was very interested in was the way that each generation was adding to the silver cups and marking them. Um, this one says, keep for Sally for her only, uh, indicating that it's supposed to be for her daughter. These are the original marks by the silver maker, indicating um, her husband, her name, their last name, and then the mark of the silver maker. So we constantly see each generation adding to the story of the cup through either later engravings or these carvings and small um, names on the bottom of the silver. Um, in addition, I was very interested in the way that within their own wills, the women in this family 
like many Jewish women in the colonies, use silver as a way of connecting themselves to future generations and to passing along family legacies. So um, very much part of the discussion amongst the original woman who owned it and her daughters, who they would be giving things to, what those objects were supposed to mean as they went to the next generation and what they hoped they would convey about information about the family. So again, a very different kind of way of trying to think about the objects than a Torah crown that sits in a synagogue. The third chapter, I look at ivory miniatures. Um, I think I have, if I can move correctly, here's the blow up of the picture behind me. Um, but here is, this is an ivory miniature of a woman named Sarah Brandon Moses. She's the woman who appears in the next book that's coming out in July, The Ones Who Are Slaves book. She was born enslaved in Barbados and ended up one of the wealthiest women in New York by the time she was uh, 30. And before she died, had 10 children, um, nine of whom lived to adulthood and um, who became some of the major players in the synagogue and important merchants, um, Civil War heroes, uh, surgeons. They married into the kind of aristocracy of the synagogue. So with her portrait, I was really interested um, not just in thinking about that transfer of how people came to New York. Uh, one of the consistent themes in the book is none of my women are in New York for their entire lives. They're all people in transit. I think this gets back to Carolina's point about internationalism. We think about the Caribbean in New York today because there's these huge Caribbean communities in New York. That's an old, old story. So there's really a lot of the women are coming from the Caribbean where there's bigger Jewish communities. Um, this is a blow up of Bridgetown and Barbados where she's from. She grew up along Swan Street, which is also known as Jew Street, um, which was right near the synagogue. It was also an area that was, um, would have had stores beneath the houses and was a large place where a lot of free people of color lived as well who had ties to both um, the free people of color community and the Jewish community. So you see people going back and forth a lot. Um, she was the daughter of Abraham Rodriguez Brandon, who was the wealthiest Jew on the island and an enslaved woman. And she also had a brother who was a few years older who had a miniature maid. I sort of love him in his cute hairdo. He's super charming. He's got the Bo Brummel thing down. Um, so I was really interested in not just thinking about portraits as being, here's this person, but portraits really as a way of presenting the self and part of this story of how they went from being in the Caribbean to being in New York. So the portrait itself was most likely made in London where she was sent after um, she became a teenager. She went to, um, she officially converted in Suriname because her mother was not born Jewish. Um, as did her brother. She, after that, got sent to London where she went to an elite Sephardic boarding school. And while she's in London, she meets a youngish, a slightly older man who named uh, Joshua Moses, who was part of this very um, fancy New York um, merchant family. In fact, his mother is the woman who owned the cups from the previous chapter. So she really meets this man who, um, today, I think people might have this idea of like, oh, you know, she married so well. In this time period, he is marrying very well by marrying her. It's really right at this moment where it's just become possible for low-class Ashkenazi Jews, Jews from Eastern Europe um, and from Germany to be able to marry high-class Sephardic Jews like Sarah Brandon Moses in the Portuguese synagogue. She is very clearly depicted as being part of the Nassau, the Jewish Sephardic elite in the synagogue records, and she converts it as a Sephardic synagogue, whereas he has lower class um, Ashkenazi background. So um, in addition, she brings a 10,000 pound dowry, which is a huge amount of money. Um, so really it is this moment of these two mercantile houses coming together. So what I was interested in with her portrait was really trying to think about why is it that during this time period, these small little teeny ivory miniatures are so popular amongst Jews. 
And it's really a moment where not only Jews of color, such as Sarah, but also Jews with solely European backgrounds are coming up against scientific racism. And this is really a genre very much dedicated in the way that the portraits are made to whiteness, that it relies on um, the ivory kind of glowing through the background. Um, in fact, often we'll see a sheet of silver behind the ivory to get that kind of Whoa! glow that you depict from, get from the ivory. And then very delicately in little hatching marks, these little lines or stippling little dots, putting color on top of it without trying to obstruct um, what's going on in the background. So I was really interested in how the paint was being used here and how this genre was working to help depict her as part of this white elite that was happening during this time period, that she's choosing a genre portraiture, which is very much about celebrating whiteness. And one of the things I'm very interested in in this chapter is comparing it to other multiracial women. And um, this is a woman from a miniature from a woman from Suriname and one, a woman who's originally from Haiti, but comes to New York and is part of the very important member of the early African-American community in New York. And we see here that portrait makers are very much racializing the people in the portraits by using a technique which should have been used for background or for hair to give a kind of texture. They're using this hatching mark on the skin and putting their own, in some sense, commentary on the skin itself. So everybody has a skin color, but not everybody's skin color is racialized. And here we see the portrait maker doing something which they're told not to do in portrait maker manuals, which is to use this hatching on the skin which gives them this weird scratchy appearance. Um, so very much a sort of attempt to denigrate even as they're being patronized by these women. So I was very interested that Sarah's portrait does not use these strategies um, for depicting her. So if you're interested in hearing more about her story, this is the book that's coming out in July. Lots and lots of um, different types of objects from the family were used to create that story. I'll go a little bit faster now so we can get to questions. Um, the fourth chapter is on a commonplace book, which is a little bit like a scrapbook or a Facebook for the 19th century. It's a place where people can like post little quotes that I found or little images that I made or images that somebody else made um, and you exchange it with people. So this is where it's like Facebook, like you you would give somebody like, could you write in my book, just like somebody would write on your page in Facebook. And I was really interested in looking at this as part of this way of women creating these communities around themselves. So I was really interested in who she was quoting and who the other people were quoting and how that created this network around her of intellectually and also an interpersonal um, network between people, which ended up being very important because her husband uh, I would say loses his job, but quits his job during the Civil War, and she ends up having to support the family as a teacher. And the fifth and final chapter is on silhouettes. And here um, I was a little bit um, helped by the fact that silhouettes are cheap, and hence there's lots of them. Um, so there's quite a few number of silhouettes from early Jews. And I was really interested in this one family that was a rabbi's family that came into New York where the husband was actually writing a lot about the importance of women and for Jewish families and why families were so important for the continuation of Judaism. So in this silhouette, I'm really comparing the way their family is depicting themselves to how Jews depicted themselves in other silhouettes from this time period. So those are, that's kind of an overview of the five chapters. It gives you a little bit of a taste of some of the methods of what I'm doing. I'm really trying to go back and think about how these objects can help fill us in on the ways that women were key players in constructing Jewish identity and families. Some key takeaways would be one, um, there are some real structural reasons why we are not having lots of pieces of writing from women for this time period. And those structural reasons are important for us to be talking about as part of the story of women's history. Second, that the kind of objects that we're looking at kind of shift if we want to center women in our discussion for this time period, even when we're talking about a religious group. 
that we're going to stop necessarily talking about the objects used by men and use the ones used by women, which seems obvious, but really is a change in the way that we've thought about Judaica. And third and finally, this approach ideally, I think, can help us get away from only looking at the uber, uber wealthy, but actually to get at some of the diversity of women's experiences. There's women who were very poor and women who were very wealthy and women who started out poor and ended up wealthy and women who started out middling and ended up very poor, um, women who could write, women who couldn't write, um, women who were more religious or less religious. But again, some who were Sephardic, some were Ashkenazi, really not trying to have one woman speak for all of them, but to try and get more at that complexity of how women are experiencing their daily lives in early US cities. Thanks so much. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Laura. Let's uh, give Laura a much needed applause. Let's just uh, go to reactions and let's do clap, clap, clap in reactions. <laughs> I encourage everybody to do that. Let's have all these hands clapping. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this absolutely wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, you know, what, what I was thinking about uh, our program, our MA program um, has uh, an emphasis on hemispheric studies. Hmm. And uh, in, your, in your talk, it was uh, like, you know, an ad what uh, this program <laughs> could be at uh, its best. Uh, with uh, uh, connections uh, uh, between Americans, um, questioning uh, what we think about race and how race works, uh, adding Jewishness into all of that, something that is uh, not often enough thought about in relation to color line in the US. Um, and then uh, on, on, on top of this, with one of the story of the ivory portrait lady, um, uh, Sarah, uh, the idea of, uh, you know, movement. I mean, we are in early America and it's not immigration, it's going to school uh, to London. Um, so, yeah. I, I, so this is just, you know, all these trajectories, uh, I think are absolutely amazing and, uh, on, and kind of, you know, show how hemispheric uh, can work, uh, you know, in, in, in your book, but also as a, as a structure of, as a way of thinking, uh, in a way. Uh, what I also really enjoyed uh, was just kind of, you know, this, this uh, insider look into your book, um, ex, you know, you showing us how uh, this was born out of the Gollum, <laughs> Gollum's comments. Uh, you know, and, and, and then also how in this, in this book, there are already the seeds for your uh, uh, upcoming book. So it's kind of, you know, this continuity, you know, when I think about uh, what students do so often, uh, something grabs their attention, their BA thesis, or even their term paper, then they continue um, to a BA thesis, let's say, and then uh, even to a larger degree, this becomes an MA project. And uh, uh, hopefully this is not always a nasty comment from an advisor, <laughs> uh, but rather this kind of, you know, thirst of knowledge. Um, but I think it's just so important to show, you know, these continuities and also that something really wonderful can come out from something nasty. Uh, and uh, I just really congratulate you on the strength of fighting your golem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, one more thing that I just want to say, I'm very talkative and I'm clearly on a roll <laughs> today, <laughs> um, is, you know, the, this, idea, um, uh, this idea of creating records and archives and, in fact, memory. So the students from my class in uh, uh, BA elective Making Memories are, are, are here and we are reading a part of this, uh, the introduction to, the, to Laura's book as uh, thinking about thinking about memory and what gets recorded. And you know, when I was listening to you, uh, it just kind of, I, I think the way to kind of, you know, summarize this and maybe I can, you know, start you up with this question is, um, is this idea that, you know, it's what we remember is so much uh, determined by what records we have and what records we can find and whether we can 
um, understand what is it that we don't know or kind of, you know, look for the gaps. Um, do you have any other moments like this in your, you know, in this book? Um, yeah, so I definitely, one of the things that I was really interested in throughout the book was trying to figure out like, how did things end up in museum collections or archives? And for the first letter that I was looking at, we're really indebted to um, a rabbi who started off his life in Suriname. I noticed somebody put something in the comments about Suriname, uh, who had also come from Suriname up to the US, Jacob, Judah, and Lyons. And he was really this incredible collector of early Judaica. And his collections became the start of much of what uh, we see at American Jewish Historical Society today. But he has his own biases and what he collects, right? Like he's a rabbi, he's interested in the synagogue, and he collects things that are related to communal life. So his collection is like the basis of every history of early Jews in New York, but all of us are at the mercy of what he thought was interesting, right? So, um, and apparently women were not that interesting to him, but I think also like there wasn't that much stuff, right? So, but I think just having that moment of recognizing, oh, I've got a sampling bias based on the archive, that for me is a really important moment too in thinking about our histories of part of the history of early New York is who later decided what was important and what's worth preserving. Thank you. Let's uh, let, let's get into some questions. So Zofia Bachevska uh, is, is asking a question about um, education. Um, uh, and this was, I think, in the context of the uh, first, the protagonist of, of the first chapter in your, in your book. Let me just read it out loud to everybody. Do you think that Jewish women wanted to get the education mended or the education we would call normal in the colonies? Or did the education they uh, they did get was enough for them. Uh, there is one more qualification, and if their education was enough uh, for uh, for them, uh, do you think that it was because of religious beliefs? So mm. I think it's a complex question about, yeah, like, you know, totally. what did women think about um, the education they were getting? Yeah, it's a great question, and again, I, here I feel like we're a little sorry because we don't have tons of until the era of Rebecca Gratz, we don't have tons of statements about women about like what they want for education. Uh, Rebecca Gratz, for people who don't know her, is somebody who started the Sunday school movement, but also in the 1830s and 40s really started off this push towards making sure that Jewish women who were impoverished could have the exact same access to education that boys were having. And so we see synagogues start to have these schools which are very deliberately um, open to women in the girls in the community as well. Um, and more importantly, perhaps even, we start to see women running those schools, whereas a generation earlier, so before 1800, the schools are really all run by men, um, usually coming over from Europe um, or from someplace else where there's more education in order to train the next generation of people. So, so really, um, very, very much very. And I think the other big innovation that happens is that suddenly by about the 1820s, there starts to be debates about opening up education to everybody in public schooling and the shift towards public schooling is just gonna radically change things. So part of the problem during this time period is you have to pay for, to have your kids educated. So for poor families, they're really reliant on charity from the community in order to get their kids sent to school and um, who they can afford to let go to school. And so for poor families, which make up over half of the Jewish population in the colonies, women often don't get sent to school for those families, right? So that wouldn't be somebody like Hannah. She clearly went off to some kind of school. So she was originally wealthy enough to get sent to school. Um, but for the vast majority of Jewish women, there was no, education. And we do see men denigrating Jewish women for only speaking the Creole dialects and not speaking the regular language of the colonies and not being able to sign their names as if somehow the women had chosen not to go to school or something, whatever. So, so that is a consistent problem. But we do also see when women are asking for help from the community to, to educate the poor, 
they're almost always asking for help for their son. So can I get a suit of clothes so my son can go to school? Um, can I get this so my son can go to school? Almost never for their daughters. So you see that bias already built in of like who they know that the mom mod is going, the governance board is going to be willing to give charity to so that they could go and get that education. So really kind of heartbreaking that somebody doesn't even have clothes to go to school. So I, I feel like there's that aspect of the normal education is really kind of already for people who are middle class, which is not most of the people. Um, in terms of the shift that we see later when women take over the education, we really do see it kind of a more of a shift towards um, a different way and different values in educating. And uh, Laura Yaris is working on this and she would be the person to ask about it, that she's doing great work on sort of what happens with Jewish education during this time period. But we, it was really a moment where we're seeing a lot of change happening. Um, and that change benefits us as historians because women start to create documents because they get educated in the regular languages. And part of it is just like what people, whether somebody's gonna keep something later depends on what language it was written in, right? So we only have that letter that was written in Spanish because somebody kept it because it went to Aaron Lopez, a guy they were interested in, and they kept it for because of the signature that had to do with Lopez. So it was only because she sent it to some guy that somebody who collected later documents, like he's very clear about why he kept them. It has nothing to do with her, right? So it's really just sort of a fluke that it ends up being preserved. But um, otherwise we would never really know that she's, she's great in Spanish. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that helps with the education part, but part of the problem is, you know, when do we get women writing about the way they want to be educated? I mean, you know, one thing that I think uh, you're, uh, uh, you know, really doing here for uh, students at ASC is that we very rarely have courses in early American history or mm. culture. So, uh, you know, the thing, like, you know, you're, you're showing, like, you know, to over 100 people here that this is incredibly sexy and <laughs> that we are, <laughs> they are missing out really on, uh, on a lot. And this is something uh, to definitely do. Um, another thing that, you know, is, is, is probably new for uh, more students, but uh, Mikolai uh, uh, Zubel wrote this in the chat, you know, thanking you for, uh, uh, you know, generally telling about, you know, Jewish histories in the Caribbeans. And uh, I, I, I kind of don't, uh, don't expect you now kind of to, you know, hey, let's have a lecture on Jews in the Caribbeans. But, uh, but would you kind of, uh, um, um, I don't know, just kind of uh, 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 tell us, you know, how, how was it that you got into, you know, doing this? And this may be connected to another question in the chat, you know, why New York? So what's the connection yeah. between, you know, Caribbeans and New York? I think we can, we can combine these two questions into kind of, you know, a geographic uh, thing. Yeah, so, yeah, to really back up, back up, back up, um, uh, I began my career working uh, in Native American studies and my, er, my dissertation and my first book um, before I started working in Jewish studies were on Native Americans in the Northeastern United States during the colonial period. And so my first book was a community study of women, children, and men on Martha's Vineyard in the Wampanoag community. And when I finished with that, I was sort of trying to figure out like, okay, what community would I like to study now? And um, I was, my husband was part of the Sephardic community and I kept on getting all these questions about like, what about Sephardic Jews? So it was like, well, that, that actually fits with my language skills much better than Wampanoags anyway. So let's check that out. And so I was like, oh, here's Newport, Rhode Island. I'll study Newport, Rhode Island. It's got this great community. It's in the Northeast, you know, like it's all, it's all good, it's all good. And, um, one of the things that it started to happen as I, as I studied Newport, or Rhode Island, which has this big, important early Jewish community, was I would have a list of all my people on the census, and then the next census, half of them would be gone. I was like, what? Where did my people go? And then the next census, they'd be back. I'm like, my people are back. And then they'd be gone. And then they'd be back. And it's like, what is going on? This is so not my experience of having worked with indigenous communities and the colonies. And so I was started trying to track like, where are they going? And the answer by and large was the Caribbean um, or to Amsterdam or London. So Amsterdam and London and Hamburg being the big feeder communities for Jews in early America. 
So, uh, but the Caribbean answer is, it turns out that before 1825, the biggest, the wealthiest, the best educated Jewish communities are all in the Caribbean. Um, and so the biggest communities are Curacao and Suriname, which are both primarily Dutch. Occasionally they go back to English, um, but my, mainly Dutch colonies. And um, then Jamaica and Barbados, which are British colonies. So both places where Jews were going, um, in part because there were liberal policies towards Jews because they were Protestant countries, and in part because Jews were given special privileges for trading and not they didn't have to march in the military on the Sabbath and all sorts of things. So they were able to have openly Jewish communities and have rights as citizens that they actually couldn't have in Europe at the time. Um, that a lot of the, particularly in the British colonies, you actually had a better chance of becoming naturalized in the colonies than you did and your citizenship ranking than if you were in London, for example. So, so I was really interested then in those Caribbean stories. So maybe that helps explain the Caribbean part of it. Um, so Suriname has this huge community. So when Sarah and her brother go there from Barbados to convert, it's not where most of us would go to convert today, but at the time, it's got the second largest or maybe even the largest Jewish community in all of the Americas. It's got tons of moils of ritual circumcisers. It's got like seven or something like them in one city. Um, it's got Jewish schools, it's got several synagogues and it has the largest multiracial Jewish community in all of the Americas. Um, so it, uh, at least 10% of the community are openly identified as being Jews of color. And Aviva Ben-Ur, who works specifically on Suriname, has estimated that because of the way race works differently in Suriname and uh, sort of whitening over time, that maybe about 50% of the community had at least one African ancestor by this point. So it's really a much more, a, a much more obvious place to go as a Jew with as somebody who wants to become Jewish and has partial African ancestry to convert much, like the place to go for this time period. So thank you to the person who brought up the Suriname. Suriname is like not inconsequential and we, a lot of early rabbis um, and people in the US come from Suriname because it's an important um, place um, for the colonies. Again, it's one of those like colonial geography is, is off. I still remember when I worked on Newport, there was a letter that somebody wrote, New York, a small town near Newport, Rhode Island. It was like, so, so touching. You know, it's not, not how we think of New York today as a small town near, near Newport, Rhode Island, but um, it gives you a sense colonial geographies are different, right? So um, I think the, the last part of what you're asking was um, the question that had to do that I see in the comments about why the research in New York. And as you can see, New York is not my obvious place to be. Um, I was very generously um, given a visiting position at Bard Graduate Center, which is a material culture graduate program in New York on the Upper West Side. Um, and as part of that um, time when I was at Bard Graduate Center, I gave a sequence of lectures that became the background for this book. Um, so I was really trying to think about taking what I knew and rethinking it through the lens of New York as part of this New York milieu. Um, so that's what answer is just kind of logistically, it came out of my experience at Bard. Um, I would say part of the reason why that made sense to me is New York looms so huge in later Jewish history. And yet I feel like our early histories of New York Jews are really wonky in some ways. And so I was really, for me, it was a sort of challenge of how to rethink that early time period a little bit. I don't know if that helps. Um, yeah, there was, um, there's one more question. Do you want me to answer that question about what was so appealing in the small colonial town, the town uh -huh. near Newport, that yeah. Jews decided to stay there? So New York uh, doesn't take off population wise until um, probably the 1840s or so. So my last chapter is really as it's taking off. Um, and it really is this, influx of German Jews that are coming in. So they're being pushed out of Europe due to wars um, and Jews from Poland as well. Um, so German, you know, like there isn't really any Germany during that time period. So you know what I mean? You know this better than I do. But, um, but in any case, you know, in this, what we call German area today, but also from Poland. And um, 
really part of what happens after the Revolutionary War in the United States is um, the, it starts to reshift the economies in the colonies, um, and particularly the Jewish community. So those Caribbean communities often were sugar colonies, and with the fall of slavery and with the wars that are going on between the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, sugar colonies really rely on trade and are not good at being self-sustaining. They often don't even make their own food. And so with the sort of embargoes and with um, different trade routes getting cut off, the economies really collapse and Jews often flee those places to other places by the beginning part. That's why sort of in the 1820s, things start to shift, that those communities have become very poor as slavery starts to wind down. Um, and just because um, largely having to do with having focused on one particular product was not a good long-term move. In contrast, New York actually is very diverse in terms of the products that it has and is much more, um, it has a much more diverse economy. And so it, it really takes off during this time period. The Erie Canal doesn't hurt um, as well as something that sort of pushes New York to become much more important. So people flood into New York and Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, there was one more question about, you know, that is uh, more about gender and kind of coming back to records and creating records and uh, women writing and, and not writing. And I think this is just kind of, you know, a follow up to what you've been talking about um, at the beginning of your talk. Uh, you know, how much of this is, uh, uh, you know, culturally or historically conditioned? How much of this is uh, the question of uh, religion and Judaism being so much gendered? Uh, you know, what is going on here with record keeping and gender and, and yeah. religion? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think of a couple different comparisons. Uh, a lot of the theory about archives that I'm drawing off of actually comes out of African-American and Afro-Caribbean studies. Um, and it's something that we definitely see um, as sort of a larger product during this time of who's considered valuable across the colonies um, and which voices get silenced and which voices when later scholars have a cry for evidence, um, as one scholar puts it, like when is that an unreasonable request because those were the very people who were denied acts whose works were not being preserved to begin with for structural reasons. So I feel like there are some ways in which this is a larger story um, for women and for enslaved people across the colonies. So that sort of speaks more to the chapter on Sarah Brandon in terms of what's available from her early story. Um, in terms of the Protestant colonies, just thinking back to when I worked, for example, in Native American communities, um, those schools were, um, they did, I'm not sure benefit is the right word, but um, there was money coming in from Europe to um, educate impoverished Native Americans, both women, both girls and boys. So those early schools for the poor were very much because of the way that people thought about education in Protestant communities as being important to salvation, that was something that you tended to see be a little bit more egalitarian. So I think in that sense, you could say there's something religiously about like what, what kinds of educations matter for religious continuity and where religion lies. Um, but, we have, we have similar problems with early Native American communities in the Northeast with having texts from women. Um, but I would say that's just generally within the indigenous communities in the colonial period, there's a paucity of texts. So it's it's a little less, I don't know, that's less gendered, but, but certainly the education system does differ based on notions of what's the purpose of education and particularly the kinds of Protestantism we see in um, what were previously Puritan colonies that were emphasizing um, congregationalism. So congregationalist groups or Quakers too um, would be much more likely to feel that um, 
it's important that everybody have access to the Bible. And so therefore that kind of education was really important for everybody, not just for men. Um, so I don't know if that helps a little bit. So I, do, I think that people are not incorrect in assessing out that there might be something structural in the religious impulse of who is who needs the education and for what. It's a good question. I hadn't really thought about it before. Mm. Um, you know, what really struck me um, uh, uh, in one of these stories uh, was the moment when secular laws uh, were intervening uh, into uh, what we would very much think as a uh, strongly religiously influenced community. Yeah. Um, and just kind of, you know, different orders of, of, uh, of, of, of law kind of clashing uh, to the detriment of women, it looks yeah. Um, I don't know whether you have any more, you know, commentary on this, but I, I, I found it extremely striking and extremely oppressive, of course, but, uh, you know, just striking that uh, uh, there was like, there was no help, there was no, there's no hope. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely, I feel like this is a story we, you know, for those of us who are interested in Jewish marriage contracts, for people who don't know, uh, for to, for a legal Jewish marriage, there's supposed to be a marriage contract. And that marriage contract is supposed to lay out not just the dowry and the groom's gift. So there's usually a money from both sides of the family coming in, but in addition, protects the wife if the husband dies, what money goes back to her, or if he divorces her, what money goes back to her. And it usually plays out in terms of were there children, were there not children, but it's a way of the woman's family protecting their investment. If the, hus the husband can't just like do what happens in Jane Austen novels where you marry the rogue and he gets your entire estate and now you can't do anything. Like it really is supposed to counteract that sort of moment. And Jewish marriage contracts are during this time period used somewhat differently than we see them in most communities today. So in the most of the communities in early America um, because they were having to officially mark the marriage for people. There, it varied whether there were secular marriages um, and because of the way that um, just Spanish and Portuguese congregations, so Western Sephardic congregations work, they would keep what are called ketuba registers. So they'd have a copy of everybody's marriage contract in addition to you having your own personal one that you could show people. And that proved that you were Jewish and that your kids would be Jewish but it also protected the women so that they wouldn't have to, so if something happened like in Anna's case, she should have gotten a certain amount of money back from this state. And part of what's interesting to me is, um, where was Hannah's marriage contract, you know? So um, was it something that she didn't keep track of or was it something that got lost? She Maybe she married in Europe and she came over, she didn't have it. Or was it that state laws trumped it? It's not really clear from the records because they're spotty. So that moment of that conflict between the Jewish communities really trying to protect the widows um, and in some sense protect the community because so much of their money goes to, to helping widows and orphan children that um, is really in conflict with the values of the secular community, but doesn't seem to trump it in ways that you would hope. We definitely see it happening in the women's wills as well. So women who can afford to write a will, it's something, um, you know, now during COVID I often feel like, ah, I need to go write a will. You know, I sort of feel the pressure more than I used to, but um, but it's it just like today, it's an expense. It was really an expense then that you would need to get somebody to write it for you. They're very technical, um, honestly, and very formulaic. So. Um, but we see women protecting their daughters against if you marry somebody in my, if, if my daughter gets this much money, if somebody marries her, it's hers and it has, her husband doesn't have any control over it. So we really see that women starting to kind of say like, I'm not even going to rely on the ketuba, the marriage contract. I'm going to write it into my will that I'm gonna protect my daughter's inheritance. Um, so that's one side. Then we also see people being very manipulative in their wills as well. So you'll see people saying like, 
she can only inherit if she marries him. Um, and you never have to say that if she wants to marry him, it's always like if she marries her cousin, David, she can inherit this, otherwise she gets a dollar. Um, so they can be very like aggressive in trying to coerce women into doing things as well. But the wills are a really interesting resource um, for trying to think about how people protect women and also how people propagate sort of like family continuity um, for women who are marrying into other families in some sense too. Um, if people are interested in that, I highly recommend Stan Mervis has a book on the early community of Jamaica that's based pretty much all on wills. And it's a fascinating book. So I proselytize Stan's book on how you could do a really interesting history, um, just looking at wills and how they function. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, I always love recommendations. <laughs> live <laughs> recommendations. Uh, so let's let's do some clapping. Thank you so much for uh, oh, for this wonderful so for talk and uh, uh, generous answers to uh, to our questions. I hope we'll uh, see you on time again at ASC. Uh, I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Always have ideas. Uh, thank you so much uh, once more.